I don't want to panic people, but you did show a slide at a recent conference that showed that MRI is great. You got to use MRI within active surveillance with certain guidelines, but you're still to the point where around the country, there's just not a lot of, there's not a lot of consensus in terms of, there's a lot of people who aren't necessarily great at reading MRI. That's how I translated your slide. Can you elaborate? Sure. It's a, uh... So there is a consistent guideline in terms of how to read a prostate MR. It's called the PIREDS system. Uh, but there's a lot of inconsistency in the way the radiologists actually assign the points to calculate the PIREDS score. And it takes a lot of expertise. Um, you know, and I think this is not necessarily recognized out there in, in the world. Um, you know, some, a lot of radiology tests are very easy and very consistent. If you need a CAT scan of your kidneys, you can show up to pretty much any CAT scan center get the CAT scan and any radiologist is gonna be able to look at your kidneys and, and describe what they see. Uh, prostate MR is not like that. Um, it takes, actually, I only learned a couple of years ago how much subtlety there is even in setting up the machine. A hospital can have two Siemens or two GE MRI machines and they have to be calibrated differently. Hmm. Um, so, and then how you set up the prostate package, basically how you actually set up the MR protocol for MR takes a lot of experience. And then reading the multiparametric MR uh, definitely takes a lot of expertise. And there've been some great studies out there showing a lot of variation. Um, you know, Stanford down the street from us uh, does maybe not quite the volume we do, but they're certainly a high volume prostate MR center. They published a great study, which I'm sure if we had the courage to repeat it, we'd find the same thing, you know, depending on which Stanford University radiologist happens to read your MRI, the likelihood that a PIREDS-5, meaning a high, you know, bad looking lesion actually represents a high grade cancer, grade group two or higher, ranges from 40% to 80%, you know, within a, within a university. Uh, and this has been shown repeatedly, even at, you know, the NCI is the best MR center in the country, probably. Uh, same thing. They've got two radiologists there that are super high volume and do nothing but prostates, and they're really good. But when you take the still reasonable volume, you know, middle volume NCI radiologists, their agreement drops off very rapidly. So, you know, it's not, I've, I've got, I've, I've developed this reputation as being anti-MRI. I'm, I'm not at all anti-MRI. We do a ton of anti-MRI, um, but, you know, MRI is, is, a, is a test. We will drag the patients down three hours from Northern California to get the MRI done here at UCSF. And, you know, and we're, and I'm very cautious about accepting it as a replacement for biopsy until we're better at interpreting them. There's a lot of interest in machine learning and AI systems to do a better job with the information there. And there's plenty, there's lots of other very cool tech and development to improve our, our imaging. But what you're saying to me is, because I'm thinking of the tangibility of all of this, yeah. you know, the patients who are watching. Sure, sure. That if there's any concern about the person reading your MRI in terms of experience, I'm, I'm gonna try to be delicate here, that you may to, you may need to think about either getting it at another place or having it read by someone else as a second opinion. Do you agree with that? Let me be even more forceful about it. Every okay. single aspect of prostate cancer care after the PSA, I'm talking about the MRI, the biopsy, treatment discussions, having surgery, radiation. This should all be done at centers of excellence. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be an academic center, but it's got to be a place that focuses on this. Some of the big community urology groups have a few urologists that have. You know, prostate cancer is what they do, just like it is for us in academics. That's fine. But, you know, that you are always going to get better care in subspecialty centers for prostate cancer than you will with someone who sees a few of them a year and is taking care of kidney stones and BPH and incontinence and everything else yeah. in general urology practice, um, almost, you know, across the board. And, that's, and that is true. And fortunately, prostate cancer is almost never an emergency. You know, we have this problem in, in bladder cancer where we know the clock is really ticking. We have the same situation where outcomes are better in academic centers, but if you don't get your bladder either under chemo or out within three months of diagnosis of a high-grade bladder cancer, you are much more likely to die of the disease. Prostate is not like that. This thing moves slowly. You have months, you have years in some cases. So take the time to get to a center where this is what we eat, breathe, live, and sleep. Um, yeah, no, that's well said, really because a lot of people will say, so I think I know where you fall on this. A lot of people will say, I got to decide immediately. Yeah. And there's this old saying now that I hopefully is coming out that it's better to decide in a smart fashion than decide in a quick fashion. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely.